Faith, hope, love. These three characteristics picture an important trinity for the Christian life. That's what Dr. J. Vernon McGee says in today's study on Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'm so glad that you've joined us. You know, I love how Dr. McGee describes faith as something based on past historical fact, and love as something that we experience and express in the present, and hope as tied to the coming of Jesus Christ in the hopefully near future. Our study is in Colossians 1, beginning at verse 2, so turn there now as we ask God for his help in understanding his word today. Heavenly Father, thank you for your promise that a heart that seeks you finds you. Please guide us today as we study your word and show us what you know we each need. We ask this in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now we pick up our study today, friends, in Colossians, the first chapter, and we'll put in again today at verse 2, as we did not finish that last time. I hope that you have your Bible open to this passage of Scripture and have before you our notes and outlines. You'll find it will make this study more meaningful to you. Now we are in this introduction to the epistle to the Colossians. Now, we find here Paul putting down his almost a stereotyped introduction, as you find it in some of his other epistles. And he addresses it to the saints. And as we said before, these saints are those that are set aside to God. He's not differentiating between saints and faithful here at all. And faithful means they're believing brethren. And believing brethren are faithful brethren. And they're in Christ, and we have gone into that several times, and I bypass that for the time being, for the emphasis here is upon the person of Christ, which are at Colossae. And it's important that we have an address down here, but we ought to have an address up yonder also, in Christ. Now he uses this very formal introduction, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you must know the grace of God to experience the peace of God, by the way. Now, he says it's from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, actually, in the better manuscripts, and our Lord Jesus Christ is not there. And that, my friend, is very important to see. Because, you see, the heresy that Paul was counteracting was Gnosticism, first heresy in the church. And this was the Essene branch of it. And they relegated God to a place far removed from man. You had to go through emanations to get to God. And have you ever noticed that all heathen religion and most of the cults like that, they have some sort of an open sesame before you can get into God. Well, may I say to you that Paul makes it very clear here that this is directly from God, our Father, and we can come directly to him, by the way. And in verse 3, he says, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We go directly to God. You don't have to go through any form of emanation at all. If you are in Christ Jesus, we have access. That's one of the benefits of being justified by faith is access to God. And it's through our Lord Jesus Christ, as he makes it very clear here. And he says, praying always for you. Now, if you are making a prayer list of the Apostle Paul, put down the Colossians. He always prayed for them. They were on his prayer list. Now he said, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. Now, I would emphasize that in a very particular way here. He's going to talk about the good points of these folk. And 
he puts together here, if you'll notice, faith and love and hope. And if you notice that, hope is in verse 5, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, and whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. And may I say it, the truth of the gospel means the content of the gospel, the great truths that pertain to the gospel of the grace of God, by the way. Now, you'll notice something, I think, here very important to see. Paul's talking now about their good points, and rightly so. They had faith toward God, and that is, by the way, for the past. Faith rests upon historical facts. God has a shut-up to a cross, and it's to believe God. You see, you haven't heard the gospel unless you've heard something to believe, not something to do, something to believe. It's what he did for you and me 1,900 years ago. Now, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's not a leap in the dark. It's a resting upon historical facts, and it's believing God. Now, that's for the past, but there's love for the present. And you notice he speaks here of that, and your love which you have to all the saints. And my friend, it's almost, I think, nonsense today to talk about how fundamental we are and then to spend your time crucifying the brethren, attempting to find fault with them attempting to call them something less than you are, because you are a wonderful saint, and they just have not measured up to your high standard, and they're not separated like you are separated. My friend, the world today is not interested in that approach. The world would like to know whether you love each other or not. And the hypocrisy today of fundamentalism is it loves to knock the brains out of some brother, and shows very little love in many places. Now, there are many men I disagree with about one thing and another. I can't expect them all to be perfect, of course. So I should bear with them, therefore, and pray for them. And I asked a man that, oh, he came to me to criticize one of the leaders today, and I don't agree with that leader on many of the things that he does. But boy, the Spirit of God's using him in a mighty way. And I asked him, I said, do you ever pray for him? Well, he says, of course not. Well, I said, I think you ought to. I think you ought to pray for him. God is using him. The Spirit of God is using him. And friends, these Colossians, they had some good points, and they had faith toward God. They were sound in the faith. They were fundamental, but they had love for the brethren. And that's important. And that is for the present, you see. Now, there's hope for the future here. Paul puts these three graces together for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. And I'd like for you to notice a little thing. Over in the 13th the First Corinthians, he lists these three there, but he lists them a little different. Now abideth, faith, hope, love. These three. He puts hope second, love last. Why? Because love's the only thing going to abide. It's the only thing. It's not only for the present. It's going to make it into eternity. So we need to begin to exhibit that down here upon this earth. How wonderful this is. Now he says, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, and that hope is the blessed hope, looking for the coming of Christ, and we're to love his appearing also. Whereof, he says, ye heard before in the word of the content of the gospel. Now, the gospel is a simple gospel. It's true. And you're asked to believe. You're asked to believe certain facts. But there are a lot of facts that are connected with the gospel. He's virgin born. He performed miracles. He's the God-man. And he died on a cross. He was buried. He rose again. He ascended back into heaven. He sent the Holy Spirit into the world on the day of Pentecost to form the church. And he's sitting today at God's right hand. Now, that position is given to us because of the fact that our redemption is completed 
And we are asked today to enter into that rest that he offers to those that will come to him. But he has a present ministry of intercession for us, and I think other ministries. And then he's going to come again. And that is all part of the glorious gospel, the content of the gospel, as Paul puts it here. Now he says, "...which is come unto you as it is in all the world." Now, that's a very strong statement. Dr. Vincent, a great expositor of the epistle to the Colossians as well as others, he believes it's hyperbole. And I'll be honest with you, I had difficulty accepting that. You mean to tell me, Paul, that the gospel at this particular time when you were in prison in Rome had reached the world? That's what Paul said. And I take it, it, we take it literally, and I believe Paul means what he said. And you know, I did not realize the accuracy of this until I stood in Turkey at the city of Sardis. They dug up part of that Roman road that was there. And that's the road Paul came down out of the Galatian country on the way to Ephesus. And there for three years, the gospel sounded out and people were there from all over the Roman Empire. And already it had gone ahead to Rome, and Paul had not gone there until he was taken there as a prisoner. And the gospel was being preached throughout the Roman Empire and the world. Here's the word cosmos, and it just simply means the Roman Empire of that day. And it means that the gospel at this time had penetrated into the farthest reaches of the Roman Empire. It had crossed over to Great Britain. It had crossed over to other places. Every part of the Roman world had heard the gospel at this particular time. I tell you, friends, those early apostles were on the move, and I find it rather reluctant to try to criticize them. And he says here, it's coming to all the world, the Roman world, and it bringeth forth fruit. And where the gospel is preached, it'll bring forth fruit where the Word of God is given out, the content of the gospel is given out, it'll bring forth fruit. That's what he said, and it will. And by the way, I must confess, my faith was weak even on radio. I determined to give out the Word, but I'll be honest with you, I expected to fall on my face and see great failure. And you know, the biggest surprise of my life is, God blessed His Word. Was I surprised? I thought He'd let me down, but He didn't. He said he'd bless his word. Count on him, friends. It bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God and truth. And I'm overwhelmed today by the letters and the people I meet that say they were brought to Christ through this weak radio ministry of ours that is a Mickey Mouse operation, if there ever was one. But God blesses his word. And I just don't only believe it, I know it. I'm not even prepared to argue that with anybody today. Somebody comes along and says to me, I don't believe the Bible's the Word of God. I said, you don't? And they said, well, don't you want to argue? I said, no. They said, why? I said, because I know it's the Word of God. I don't believe it. I know it. Suppose somebody comes to me and says, now, McGee, I want to argue with you whether you love your wife or not. I can give you several philosophical arguments that'll show that you don't love your wife. And you know that fellow might out-argue me. And he might whip me down intellectually. And if he did, and if he showed by logic and all types of argument that I don't love my wife, you know what I would say? I'd say, brother, I don't know about those arguments, but I want you to know one thing. I love my wife. I love my wife. I know that, you see. And I do not need these cogent, sophisticated, astute, esoteric, arguments. There's some things we can know, friends, and we ought not to let what we don't know upset what we do know. And that's important for us to see today. Therefore, he says here, it bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. Say, this is wonderful, is it not? Now, he says, as ye also learn of Epaphras, our 
dear fellow servant. Now, Epaphras apparently was the leader of the pastor of the church there in Colossae. Epaphras sounds like a medicine to me, but nevertheless, that's the name of the fellow. And he says, he's our dear fellow servant. Have you noticed how graciously Paul could talk about other servants of God? Those that were preaching the Word of God, Paul had something good to say about them. But when he found a rascal, he was just like our Lord, he would really move in, and he'd say what he thought about them. The Lord Jesus, oh, he was so merciful to sinners. That woman taken in adultery, she should have been stoned to death. And notice how gracious our Lord was. And then there is that arrogant Pharisee that came to the Lord Jesus and attempted to pass a compliment. We know that thou art a teacher come from God. We Pharisees, and when we know it, brother, that's it. Lord Jesus, oh, so gently and graciously pulled him down off of his high horse. And when he got through with him, he was dealing with him as plain little old Nicky, uh, little old Nicodemus trying to be somebody. And he's nothing in the world but just a religious robot. That's all, going through rituals. And the Lord Jesus brought him down where he could say, how can these things be? And then the Lord Jesus let him see the cross. How gracious he was in dealing with folk like that. And Paul is so gracious to these. Now will you notice, who also declare unto us your love in the Spirit. Now you're going to find there'll be no great emphasis in this epistle on the Holy Spirit. And what he's making clear to them that they would not be able to exhibit this love unless it was by the Holy Spirit. He says elsewhere, the fruit of the Spirit is love, and that is very important for us to see. And here, Paul will not dwell on that aspect. He's going to dwell on the person of Christ, and when he does, then the Holy Spirit will take the things of Christ and show them unto us. That's the important thing to see. And now we're coming to that, by the way, We're past the introduction now, and we have Paul's prayer for these. And here is one of the most wonderful prayers in the Scripture. And this is a prayer that I think touches all the bases. And you'll notice what Paul prays for here. The interesting thing is that today we find people praying for these things. And Paul makes it clear that we already have these things. I've heard prayers like this. Dr. Ironside puts it like this. He says, We pray thee, forgive us our sins and wash us in the blood of Jesus. Receive us into thy kingdom. Give us of thy Holy Spirit and save us at last for Christ's sake. Amen. And did you know that God has already answered every one of those petitions already? God has forgiven us all of our trespasses. We're cleansed by the blood of Christ. He's already translated us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love. And He sealed us with His Holy Spirit. And if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of His. And He saved us eternally from the moment we believe the gospel. Therefore, we might, I think, rather thank Him instead of petitioning Him here. Instead of saying, we ask you to do this, we thank you that you've already done it. And now listen to Paul here in this wonderful prayer that he prays. He says, for this cause, now this is verse 9 of chapter 1 of Colossians, for this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, this is great. This is the first thing. He prayed that they might be filled with the knowledge here. And that is epigenosis. Now, you see, these people, the heretics there, were the Gnostics. They pretended to have a super knowledge. And Paul says here, I pray that you might be filled with the 
knowledge, that you might have a super knowledge. The Gnostics boasted they had it. And Paul here confines this knowledge, though, of the will of God. And it must be in wisdom and spiritual wisdom and understanding. And now wisdom will occur 40 times in this epistle. We'll call attention to it again when we get to it. Now, will you notice verse 10? Here's the second thing he mentions. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Now, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. That is, pleasing to God. And that means that we're not going to be bowing down to men or attempt to please them. And then the third thing, being fruitful in every good work. That is, a Christian is a fruit-bearing branch, you see. We should bring forth fruit and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, a Christian should not be static, but alive and growing in the Word of God. How important that is. Now, let me keep moving right along. In verse 11, we have here the fifth thing. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. And strength and power can only come from God. And they are produced by the Holy Spirit in patience and long suffering and joyfulness. Strengthened with all might. And it's unto all patience, you notice. And long suffering with joyfulness. How wonderful. Verse 12, and now we come here for what he gives thanks for. Giving thanks now, and all our prayers should be filled with thanksgiving. Notice what he says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. Now, God, by his grace, has given us an inheritance with the saints in life. And we ought today to lay hold of that. Believe God. And here the second thing is, "...who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love." We've been delivered from the kingdom of Satan. We were dead in trespasses and sins, going according to the world. And now we've been translated into the kingdom of the Son of his love. And by the way, this is the present aspect of of the kingdom of God here on earth today. The only place that you can have the kingdom of God here on earth, you can't build it. The only way in the world you can have it is open your heart and receive Christ as your Savior, and you've been translated into that kingdom yourself. This is a very wonderful thing. And we're told here, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Now, this, again, is a very wonderful thing that we've been translated. We have forgiveness. And that is always, as we've said before, associated with the blood of Christ. God does not arbitrarily and sentimentally forgive sin. And redemption here means he paid a price and delivered us out of slavery. And we have these five wonderful things, and yet there are a great many people praying for all of these things today. My friend, they are yours. Why don't you thank him for them? That is the proper attitude of believer today. We'll have to leave right off there, but now next time we're going to look at the person of Jesus Christ. Remember in the Song of Solomon, we talked about him, but now we're going to really come in close and see actually the theology of it all. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Tomorrow, as we continue our study of Colossians, Dr. McGee promised that we'll study the theology of Christ, which is just another way to say that we'll look closer at who Jesus Christ is, what he's like, and what we can know about his person and purposes. If you'd like to invite a friend to hop aboard the Bible bus with us, have them visit ttb.org forward slash listen. There they can listen online, they can find links to our apps and MP3 downloads, or search for a station in their area that carries through the Bible. Or if you'd prefer to give the gift of Dr. McGee's entire five-year study of every book of the Bible, it's available in a couple of different formats. 
First, you can visit ttb.org to find out more about our Solar Bible Bus or our Bible Bus flash drive, or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE, and we'll be happy to tell you about these great resources and the many others that we offer to help you deepen your personal study of God's Word, including our terrific ministry newsletter that highlights extra teaching from Dr. McGee and gives deeper insight into Through the Bible's global ministry. Again, these resources are available by visiting ttb.org or calling us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Of course, you can also send your request to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. As we go, I'm Steve Schwetz, praying that God blesses and keeps you until we meet again. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.